Thank you, Anne, for the kind introduction. Welcome to all of you. Um, I'm glad that I can give now this second lecture with the intriguing title, The Mystery of the Cross of Light. It's a third in a series which can be subtitled Studies in the Legacy of Henri Corbin, uh, undoubtedly one of the greatest Islamic scholars of the 20th century, but who has written also extensively from a comparative religious perspective on some deeper insights of the hidden wisdom tradition within Christianity. Uh, it's not an exaggeration to say that Henri Corbin even rediscovered some hidden dimensions of Christianity through his studies of Islamic esotericism and Gnosis. And I think I can make that clear. I hope I can make that clear during this lecture. Before I explain how this lecture is built up, I would like to start with presenting you what can be considered the main text, root text, for this whole lecture. It's a text uh, that is not part of the canonical, so official uh, New Testament Gospels. It's a text from the apocryphal Acts of John. And I will start this lecture by just reading from it. Um, in order to help you understanding the text or getting acquainted with the text, I also show it in the PowerPoint so that you can read with me together. I will not comment the text at this stage. I will simply read the text as a kind of um, um, introduction to the lecture. Uh, but the main purpose of this lecture will be to try to delve deeper into this text. The text starts where the Apostle John is, as we all know, also from the New Testament Gospels, witnessing the crucifixion of his master, his Lord Jesus Christ. And the beginning of the text is quite familiar, but very quickly we get a glimpse of an interesting dimension that we can't find in the New Testament Gospels, including the Gospel of St. John himself. He says, though I saw the beginning of his passion, I could not stay to the end, but fled unto the Mount of Olives, weeping over that which had befallen. And when he was hung on the tree of the cross at the sixth hour of the day, darkness came over the whole earth. And my Lord stood in the midst of the cave, in the Mount of Olives, and filled it with light and said, John, to the multitude below in Jerusalem, I'm being crucified and pierced with spears and reeds and vinegar and gall is being given me to drink. To you now I speak and give ear to what I say. I put it in thy heart to ascend this mount so that you might hear what disciples should learn from master and man from God. And having said this, he showed me a cross of light set up. And around the cross, a great multitude which had no one form and in the cross, was one form and one likeness, and the Lord himself I beheld above the cross, not having a shape, but only a voice, and one truly divine, and it said to me, this cross of light is sometimes called the word, logos, by me for your sakes. Sometimes mind, sometimes Jesus, sometimes Christ, sometimes door, sometimes way, sometimes bread, sometimes seed, sometimes resurrection, sometimes son, sometimes father, sometimes spirit, sometimes life, sometimes truth, sometimes faith, sometimes grace. He 
This then, he continues, is the cross which has united all things by the word, the Logos, and marked off things transient and inferior and then compacted all into one. But this is not a cross of wood, which you will see when you go down here. Neither am I he who is upon the cross, whom now you do not see, but only hear a voice. Therefore, ignore the many, the multitude, and despise those who are outside the mystery. Know that I am holy with the Father and the Father with me. So far, the quote from the Acts of John. I hope you agree with me that this is quite an impressive quote, which shows us something of the mystery of the crucifixion, which cannot be found in ordinary traditional Christianity, at first sight at least. And it's not accidentally, but on purpose, called a mystery. And in this lecture, I will try to not explain this mystery, but mystery because mysteries cannot be explained, but try to more or less create the atmosphere in which the mystery hopefully can unveil itself, partly at least. But before we then can do that, it's good to know what a mystery is. We all use the word, like also in mystery novels, but the word mystery has a much essential spiritual meaning which we have to address. Then I will focus on what can be called the core mystery of Christianity, both exoteric Christianity, as you can find it in the traditional teachings of the church, whether, whether Catholic, Orthodox, or even Protestant, and esoteric Christianity. Because both exoteric and esoteric Christianity try to approach the mystery in different ways. And I hope to make clear, not necessarily in conflictuous ways, although that can be the case. The mystery can be summarized as the big question, who is Jesus Christ in the end? What does he represent? And all Christian denominations have to make a decision on, is he human, is he divine, is he both? And in what way can he be both? So the mystery of Christianity is the mystery of Christ itself. The mystery of Christianity, both exoteric and esoteric, has not so much to do with regard to the teachings that Jesus supposedly taught, like in the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount. It has to do with his identity. And I would say that the whole origin, history, and destiny of Christianity is about that question, about that mystery of the identity of Christ. I will compare, without going into much detail, the official church doctrine versus some heresies, which allows me to go to Henri Corbin, our Islamic scholar, and his view on esoteric Christology. I will then go to the metaphysics behind his view, and the metaphys metaphysics behind the mystery of the dual nature of Christ, human and divine, a crucial idea is the idea of the Logos, the word, uh, which you could also hear in the quote from the Acts of John, which works as a bridge between the divine and the human. And then I will continue by showing how the Logos, the word, or as Corbin calls it, the eternal Christ, Christus Eternus, shows himself in many forms, including the cross of light, which we refer to. So I will then go back to the cross of light and hopefully within the set time frame, but I cannot promise, 
conclude whether we are dealing here, if we compare esoteric with exoteric Christologies, teachings on the identity of Christ with competing or complementary views. What is a mystery? One of my favorite Catholic philosophers, Jacques Maritain, gives a good starting point. He says, a mystery is a fullness of being with which the intellect, human reason, enters into a vital union and into which it plunges without exhausting it. That's already deep what he says. A mystery is not something secret or hidden, uh, which you can find and unpack. No, a mystery is so full that the more you enter it, just like the horizon, the more exhausting it is. It never becomes less. And of course, the supreme mystery is concerned with the Godhead itself. What he even calls the interior life of that Godhead, to which, again, our intellect cannot rise by its unaided natural powers. It's important to realize that Jacques Maritain not only wants to use the word mystery in a religious context, which is quite self-evident, but he gives also a plea in his many books to use the word mystery with regard to science, nature, and philosophy. He says, philosophy and science also are concerned with mystery, another mystery, the mystery of nature and the mystery of being itself. What in technical language is called ontology. A philosophy, and that's quite a statement with which I fully agree, a philosophy unaware of mystery would not be a philosophy which if you look at most philosophy programs at universities would disqualify them in all honesty. What he tries to convey is that the problem of our modern culture of modernity in itself, I would even say, is that we have lost the sense of mystery. And we have reduced everything in life what for centuries were called mysteries, the mystery of good and evil, the mystery of God, the mystery of the soul, the mystery of what happens after we die. All authentic religious traditions, both exoteric and esoteric, treat these as mysteries. And Jacques Maritain would say, we have reduced them to problems to be solved. And there is a huge difference between a problem and a mystery. And I hope my whole lecture can be problematic, <laughs> but will not be um, giving you the idea that the topic of this lecture can ever be solved or should be treated as a problem. Because what's the difference between a problem and a mystery? I think the famous uh, philosopher and author Gabriel Marcel thinks more or less alike than Jacques Maritain. He says, a problem is something which I meet, which I find completely before me as an object. It can be a mathematical problem, a scientific problem, or a very practical problem, like how to repair a faucet or my roof. So a problem is something which I meet, which I can find completely before me, but which I can lay siege to and reduce. I can analyze it and reduce it to its parts. But a mystery is something in which I am myself involved. I'm not detached from it. And it can therefore only be thought of as a sphere where the distinction between what is in me and what is before me loses its meaning and initial validity. A mystery is not to be construed as a lacuna in our knowledge, as a void to be filled, but rather as a certain plenitude. Here we have that inexhaustive nature again uh, to which Maritain referred. So if we would compare a problem with a mystery, then we can say that the problem can be solved. The problem is in the end, a lack of information, a lack of technology, a lack of data. And if we have enough knowledge, data, technology, we can solve it. A mystery can never be solved. And it should be honored as unsolvable. A problem is experienced some, something outside of us. That's why we can try to control it. 
And mystery is necessarily part of our living experience. Let me give immediately an example of how treating life as a problem or as a mystery is different. A concrete illustration of it, the problem of evil. A lot of philosophies and theologies try to reduce the problem of evil as indeed a problem. The question of evil is only treated as a problem to be solved. And then you can invent a lot of theological theories to solve that issue. But I hope you see then the evil remains outside of you. Because otherwise you cannot talk about it as a philosophical, scientific or religious problem. But the issue of evil should not be treated as a problem. It's almost disrespectful towards it. It should be treated as a mystery because we are by definition part of it. We cannot detach from it. And the same is for the mystery of life, being, God, uh, the soul. We cannot detach from it. And to my own surprise, we see that in a lot of philosophical and religious endeavors, things that were always discussed as mysteries and even fought within mystery schools are indeed more often than not treated as problems to be discussed and solved. To give again a very easy example, it surprises me how many people have a very naive understanding on something as interested and complex as the Eastern teaching of karma, cause and effect. Especially in modern circles of spirituality, karma is understood in a very technical, uh, I would almost say scientific way, as simply cause and effect. Then you've reduced the misery that people experience, the good and evil, into a problem. And embracing a simplistic idea of karma is very attractive because it gives you the illusion of control over the problem. It gives you the illusion that you can explain evil. I will say you don't explain a evil, you explain it away by a very naive understanding. A naive understanding about God, a naive understanding of providence can, for the same reason, also mislead us. I hope you catch my drift. And genuine esotericism should never talk about problems, neither reduce its teaching into a problem. So I put a lot of attention to the correct attitude to treat something like the identity of Christ, the mystery of the crucifixion. Uh, I give a lot of attention to the correct attitude. And I think that's true for a lot of issues that are part of life and especially part of the religious and spiritual experience. So a problem we objectify, a mystery we participate in it. A problem keeps us out of it. A mystery draws us in, draws us closer. A problem, the more we know about it, the smaller it becomes. The more you approach life as a problem, the more arrogant you also become because you'll think you know more. And of course, that's typical for such an attitude. With a mystery, the more we know about it, the greater it becomes. It's not that when we delve into a mystery that we become more and more stupid or become more ignorant. No, we indeed get more and more acquainted with the mystery, like we can become more and more acquainted with our lover. But the more we get acquainted, the deeper the mystery becomes. And that's, by the way, also true for a good relationship with your lover. We move from one thing to another in the problem, like Churchill's definition of history, one damn thing after another. When we solve one problem, another comes up. A mystery, which if we want to explore a mystery, we have to stay, metaphorically speaking, in the same place. We have to be patient and deepen our understanding. To sum up, a problem is a very horizontal, linear approach. We analyze and we control. If we approach 
life as a mystery. We have a more vertical attitude. We go into depth or into height, no matter how you uh, depict it. And the tool is not analysis, but contemplation, which leads to gnosis, knowledge by identity, knowledge by becoming part of the mystery. <clears throat> that as an introduction, why the title is called the mystery of the cross of light and not the problem of the cross of light. And I want to seduce all of you to that idea. I think an idea which is incredibly helpful that we should not talk about what is called the death, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and we're still in the aftermath of the Easter period. That's why I chose this title. We should not be treating these issues as problems. And admittedly, Christianity itself has treated these issues sometimes as a problem, and maybe not sometimes, a lot of times. So what is then the mystery of Christianity, both exoteric and esoteric, already hinted at it. It's the nature of Jesus Christ himself. And that, that, that this did not originate a few centuries or even decades after the death of Christ. It originated already in his life when he was teaching. A good example is when Christ himself asks his disciples who he is. You can find that in the New Testament in Matthew 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist. You are John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he continues, but what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? very personal now it becomes very personal he asked his disciples directly who do you think i am and then simon peter one of them answered you are the christ the messiah the son of the living god and a footnote isn't it striking how he phrases the questions he begins by asking who do people say the son of man is he doesn't ask who do people say I am? You may think it's a minor detail, it isn't. He continues then by saying, after they have answered what people think of the Son of Man, which of course refers to him, what do you think I am? You see a shift from an impersonal perspective, what do people think he is, to a very personal relational perspective. I would say a shift from a problem to a mystery. Of course, people have a lot of views about the son of man, which is then a concept. Yes, maybe Christ is a prophet came back. Maybe it's John the Baptist, who knows? But then he makes it personal. He looks into the eyes of his disciple and say, who do you think I am? or even more concretely, who do you think that I am that speaks here really is? And then Peter says, I know, I realize you're the Christ, the son of the living God. We still don't know what is meant with that, of course. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. In other words, you didn't make up this by yourself but by my father in heaven. In other words, he participated in the mystery of Christ thanks to a revelation by the father of Christ. Now, no matter how you fill in these notions, do you see that the shift in this quote is really happening? That it becomes from an impersonal to a very personal matter. And that's typical for a mystery. You cannot disconnect from it. You're part of it or you run away, or you crucify him. <laughs> you have to take a position, but you cannot remain idle. And Peter doesn't. And the identity 
question is then clearly already a question during the life of the disciples. Otherwise, they would not debate about it. Another famous scene still in the New Testament Gospels, and three Gospels, I think, you find a similar uh, depiction of the so-called transfiguration of Christ. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. These are always the three favorite disciples. Sometimes they are connected with the thinking, the willing, and the feeling dimension of the human soul. Thinking, feeling, and willing. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain, so-called mountain of Tabor. And there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as a light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. You see in this beautiful fresco, which you can find in Florence, in the San Marco in Florence by Fra Angelico, one of the most impressive Renaissance painters, painters how indeed Moses is on the left, on our side, the right from Christ, and Elijah is on the left from Christ and the right side from us, from our perspective. They represent Moses, the law, the Torah, the Old Testament, and Elijah, the prophet, the prophets. A bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Here we see two ways of seeing things. It seems to begin with a physical perception. They physically go up to a mountain, which is also, of course, symbolical a high mountain, and we come, in, we, we will come to that later on in the lecture, symbolical of the, the, the in-between, between heaven and earth. The mountain is the highest uh, peak of the earth where heaven is touched. So whenever a mountain is used, when Jesus goes to a mountain and prays or uh, the crucifixion is on a mountain. Uh, um, we already saw in the beginning quote from the Acts of John that John escaped to a mountain and entered the cave. Whenever a mountain is used symbolically, we are in an in-between situation. Uh, Harry Corbin, we are entering the mundus imaginalis, he would say, in the top of the earth, touching the heavens. So it begins, it seems to be portrayed as a physical perception, but it must be something more than that. Through the physical presence, there is something else shown, a transfiguration. His face shines like the sun, his clothes become white, and all time and space seems to be obliterated as we ordinarily know it, because present are two figures from the past, Moses and Elijah. So, this is typically not simply a physical perception or an historical event. This is clearly an event in the soul of the disciples where time and space are transcended. Here we have a beautiful icon uh, of the transfiguration. And now I will quote from a non-canonical text. So one of the texts that didn't end up in the New Testament, um, one of the apocryphal acts, which also talks about the transfiguration. God was moved by his mercy to show himself in the likeness of man concerning which neither the Jews nor we were able worthily to be enlightened. For every one of us, and this is, you have to remember for the rest of the lecture, for every one of us, according as he could contain the sight, saw as he was able. That's intriguing. And then Peter, in the Acts of Peter, so, says, continues, when I with the sons of Zebedee, so James and John, saw the brightness of his light, 
I fell as one dead and shut mine eyes and heard such a voice from him as I'm not able to describe and thought myself to be blinded by his brightness. And when I recovered, he gave me his hand and raised me up. And when I arose, I saw him again in such a form as I was able to take in. What do we see here? That all of those present only have a visionary experience proportionate to their capacity to perceive and to receive it. So we can conclude purely phenomenologically, I mean purely by looking at the text itself, not immediately trying to explain it theologically, historically, but let the words speak themselves. That's what I call a phenomenological approach. What is happening here? We can already conclude that whatever vision it is, it's at one at the same time universal. They see all their teacher, their master being transfigured, but they all see it in a different way. By definition, this is not what we would ordinarily call a physical objective perception outside of us. But it's something that is common to all who are present. I mean, in this case, James, Peter, and John. So there is a perception which is relational, dialogical, and belongs clearly to the level of the soul. In the Acts of John, which from with which I started my lecture, there is a beautiful passage which says more or less the same. Now we hear how John describes that transfiguration event. He take it with me, with him, me, so John and James and Peter, and to the mountain where he was wont to pray, and we saw him in a light such as it is not possible for a man that uses corruptible mortal speech to describe what it was like. And further on, he says, I saw that he was not in any wise clad with garments, ordinary garments, but was seen of us naked and not in any wise as a man. And that his feet were whiter than any snow so that the earth lighted up by his feet and that his head touched the heaven. Now, now we are really getting a visionary experience that is no longer related with a physical human appearance. We see clearly a human form, but you will agree with me, a normal biological human form's head doesn't touch the heavens. And you maybe look very beautiful when you're naked, but I don't think you start to give light and are whiter than snow. So this is an anthropomorphic experience. With that, I mean the disciple sees a human figure, but with clearly a divine nature. Somewhere else in the same document, the Acts of John, who here in this beautiful sculpture, one of my favorite sculptures, very moving, very touching, because it depicts the scene and the Last Supper scene where John, who is the youngest of the disciple, very intimately um, rests his head on the chest and therefore also near the heart of Christ, which symbolically means that only John had access to the deepest identity of Christ because he could really listen to the heart of his Lord. He says something very interesting about that. Again, something you can't find in the New Testament. He says, also there was in him, in Christ, another marvel. He would take me upon his own breast. And sometimes his breast was felt of me to be smooth and tender, and sometimes hard like unto stone, so that I was perplexed in myself. This is very intriguing. Again, Some scholars, uh, name for example, uh, Corbin himself, but also more recently, Margaret Barker, 
conclude from these kind of uh, quotations, both from the canonical gospels and the non-canonical writings, that there is a striking similarity. And here you see it even if you compare icons, traditional Orthodox icons, between the transfiguration and the resurrection. One would almost say that the disciples see the resurrected Christ already before he's crucified. Would you would not agree with that? As if it's a foreboding of a true, more intimate identity, the spiritual divine identity of Jesus Christ before he's even crucified. That led to some scholars to the conclusion that Christ was really already resurrected, meaning already completely one with his father, leading to a complete transfiguration of his inner body to what could be called a resurrection body, a light body, or an original parasitical body, the body that Adam had in the paradise, an immortal body before he was crucified. And that that in itself is not such a strange idea, can even be found in again some non-canonical non gospels. For example, in the gospel of Philip, there you find the statement, Christ has everything in himself, man, angel, mystery, and the father. So you cannot reduce Christ to one thing. You cannot make Christ into just a wise prophet or a Western Buddha or only an incarnation of the divine. He transcends all categories. Maybe that's also one of the reasons why in the West there are so many Jesus images. It seems that everyone has his own personal Jesus, to quote also, I think, a song of Deepesh Mode. Uh, it is sometimes as if Christ is a kind of canvas and everyone paints on it his own view on it, including, for example, modern theosophists uh, inspired by the writers of Blavatsky. They are clearly in favor of what we could call agnostic perspective on Jesus. And the Gospel of Philip is often depicted as uh, um, wording that Gnostic perspective. That passage continues by saying, they are who say the Lord first died and then he arose. No, Philip says, or the Gospel of Philip says, first he arose and then he died. If someone does not first achieve the resurrection, will he not die? So truly as God lives, that one would. So there was clearly no agreement in the early centuries of Christianity who Christ was, what was human in him, what was divine, did he die, what did his death mean, and what even was the deeper meaning of resurrection. And we still see an echo of that these things are not to be seen as cut and dry and completely disconnected from each other, again in the iconography, where the transfiguration um, seems indeed to show already something of the mystery of the resurrection. According to some authors, even the baptism in, in Jordan is already a kind of resurrection uh, scene, but that would lead too far. So who Jesus Christ was, or I would say is, is an issue that is innate in how he's being depicted. And again, depicted both in the canonical scriptures as in the non-canonical scriptures, namely both traditional and non-traditional Christianity is founded not so much upon the idea of God itself or divine nature itself, like in Islam. Islam is completely directed to the unity of God, but on the divine manifestation, so on the manifestation of God in a human nature. That's the central idea of Christianity, no matter which denomination. The problem is how to understand that mystery, but that that is the core of the mystery of Christianity, 
all will have to agree upon. But the problem is, and now I use the word problem in the way it should be used, is that for most people, that depends on the denomination one belongs to. And I hope I can clarify this a little bit better. What's at stake here with the help of Hari Corbin amongst others. So Jesus Christ is being perceived as the embodied word, the Logos. And what does that mean? Is he divine, human, both? Did he live? Did he die on the cross? Not, was he really resurrected? What is even the meaning of resurrection? And as I tried to tell you, the first two, three centuries, we had a variety of answers on all these questions, and hence a variety of Christologies, a variety of views on Christ. The official church doctrine is quite well known. It came into full format uh, in the Council of Chalcedon in 451. You see, that's quite late. In, in history, where Christ is being seen as one divine person, the Son of God, the Word, the Logos, and the other two of the Trinity is the Father and the Holy Spirit. It's the Son who became flesh, like it stated also in the beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. And therefore, that one person has two natures, partly divine and on the other part, human. That's the official doctrine. And it has taken a few centuries before that really glued to the current uh, 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 theology. And around this official doctrine, or rather preceding that, because this official doctrine only came into existence as an answer to a lot of conflictuous views on the nature of Christ. I just name a few without going into depth. For example, what was popular at one moment was so-called Nestorianism, named to a guy called Nestor, uh, a very high uh, uh, ranked uh, person within the early church. Uh, I don't know whether it was bishop probably, uh, but that doesn't matter now. Um, and he taught that Jesus Christ were really two persons come together. Not one divine person with two natures, no, two persons who probably also has two wills coming together. That goes more or less, but it's not similar with another heresy called adoptionism, where also Jesus is considered as a human being, came into existence in the natural human way with a father and a mother, and only during the baptism in the River Jordan, the Logos, the Son of God, incarnated, or more accurately stated, adopted the human nature, hence adoptionism. Especially the Jewish Christians in the beginning of Christianity were in favor of that view. And I come back to that later because Henri Corbin seems to uh, have a lot of sympathy for this idea. Monophysitism is a mouthful. That means that what is really only counting is the divine nature of Christ. His human nature, moi, that's an accident. It's not that important. Uh, it's completely absorbed by his divinity. And that may lead to what is in some Gnostic writings, the dominant heresy from a traditional church perspective, docetism which comes from the Greek word doke, dokeo, appearing, which reduces the human nature to a mere illusory appearance, almost as if it's not really there, as if it's a phantasm. What is real, Christ is only the divine word, the Son of God. What is intriguing is that all these heresies are clearly not capable of dealing with the mystery of the dual nature of Christ as such. They can't stand in the paradox. They either want to solve it as Christ is purely divine or is purely human, or is a combination in one way or the other of both. I find that in itself interesting 
that um, the church has tried, for better or for worse, to deal with that problem of extreme views in a way that it, it has created a dogma in which one divine person got two natures. Now, whether that is a successful approach to the mystery remains to be seen, but I hope you see that there is a kind of dialectic between the official church doctrine, which has become part of modern day theology, and what has been called then the heresies. And this, these are only a few of them. Um, I mentioned adoptionism. Um, I think a very good picture of adoptionism we can get from uh, the gospel of the Ebionites, which were early Jewish Christians. And there, if you read carefully, you indeed see uh, what is from uh, 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 an orthodox perspective, uh, a very strange view on the identity of Christ. Let me quote from that gospel. After the people were baptized, Jesus also came and was baptized by John. So far, so good. We know that from the New Testament. And as he came up from the water, the heavens were opened and he saw the Holy Ghost in the likeness of a dove that descended and entered into him. Now it becomes already a little bit different from the New Testament. Because as far as I remember, nowhere is it stated in the Gospels, unless I'm mistaken, that the Holy Ghost really enters the body of Christ. And a voice from heaven saying, thou art my beloved son. That's also true in the gospels. In thee I am well pleased. Again, no problem. And then this day have I begotten thee. And straightway there shone about the place a great light. And on this account, the writer of the gospel of the Ebionites writes, and on this account they say that Jesus was begotten of the seed of a man, so clearly not only from a virgin, and was chosen during the baptism scene. And so by the choice of God, he was called the son of God from the Christ that came into him from above in the likeness of a dove. Do you now see that this is from the church doctrinal perspective, heretical, because you have a human person generated in a human way, who becomes the vehicle, so to speak, a vessel for the divine person. And hence it's called adoptionism. Just as an easy illustration to make clear that in these first centuries of Christianity, there was not one clear view on what happened during that baptism. And this view uh, didn't survive as the dominant view. But as we will see, um, I think there is still some truth in it. A truth that someone like Hari Corbin has unearthed again 